<laughs> um, yeah, hi. Oh, that's loud. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm Liv Winter. I'm an artist and act I need to stop swinging. I'm an artist <laughs> and activist from uh, South London. Um, I recently resigned from um, a residency at the Tate, and um, I'm very lucky that it opened lots of doors to meet lots of other activists. Um, I'm really excited to introduce Laura. I'm just going to read her bio. Uh, Laura, is the, Laura is the co-founder of Antidote Productions, an award-winning BAFTAs filmmaker who over the last 16 years has produced for the UK, US and international markets. Laura has executive produced all of Antidote's outputs, including most recently What Makes a Woman with Monroe. And other titles include Professor Green, Suicide and Me, Ollie Alexander, Growing Up Gay and YouTube Revolution for Nat Geo. Um, and Monroe, I think we've got a little video to introduce oh you. Oh, God. <laughs> Can we see the first clip, please? <laughs> uh, so, um, I've got a guide, because I'm quite nervous. Um, we're going to start at the beginning. Would yes. you tell us a bit about growing up and what it was like growing up? As Monroe? Um, I grew up in quite a... Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. So many of you. It's amazing to see. Um, I grew up in a really small town called Stansted, which is in the middle of nowhere. And for someone who was um, from a mixed-race household, um, a black household as well, um, and um, a very obviously queer child, um, I was... I just came out when I was about five years old and then um, went back in the closet when I was told that it was wrong and that you're confused and all of this kind of jazz. Um, but it was quite an isolating experience to grow up in the countryside and only see examples of people who are similar to you in the cities. So um, I always kind of had the desire to get out, um, like I know a lot of um, queer people do. Um, and try and find my people. So it took me a long time to um, really find who I was and find people that resonated with who I was. And yeah, it, it, was, it was difficult. I felt quite isolated. Yeah, and I guess as well, you've had a very rare experience of having to come out twice. Well, three times. Three times. <laughs> I came out, as, came out as gay originally, and then I came out as trans, and then I came out as um, pan or bi or whatever. I don't know. I'll sleep with anybody. <laughs> 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 if I find you attractive and we've got a connection, then it's, it's fair game. So, um, yeah, my, by that point, my mum was just like, whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and just, yeah. So, has your mum been supportive through this trajectory? We had a really rocky period, actually, um, where we didn't talk for about a year. Oh. Um, but I think it's difficult. There, there's no guidebook for how families adjust to a transition. Mm. And I think when a trans person comes out, you kind of go into like self-preservation mode where you're like, everyone's going to just deal with it and everyone's just going to, you know, it's my way or the highway. And it is your way or the highway because it's, you know, it's your agency. Mm. But... I think also you need to take into consideration that people love you and people haven't had this whole narrative that you've had in your head for your whole life. Mm. So for a lot of people, even though it might seem like it's quite obvious, and it probably was quite obvious, my parents probably think, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like at the time, they just they didn't even know what trans was. They didn't know like that I was, but that I'd be able to live my life mm. just with the confidence and the happiness that I have now. So I think it's a process of learning yeah. um, by circumstance. Yeah, and yeah we're, we're, we're completely fine, but we didn't, we didn't talk for a whole year. Wow. Mm. And how did your community around you respond when you, came, when you said you were going to transition? Well, I, I didn't really... I didn't have a coming out moment, really. Mm. I, I think everyone just knew because um, one day I kind of, you know... I don't know. I, I think there was, there was a period of time when my mum found out and we were on holiday and I started, just, I started growing breasts and, um, from the hormone um, replacement therapy and I just said that it was because I was drinking too much <laughs> wine. <laughs> <laughs> I said that it was um, oh, like a comastia, I think that's the yeah. word. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, I was on the spot, and um, yeah, we were in Singapore, so that, that was um, a frosty moment, and she obviously didn't believe me, no. but she just dropped it because we're on holiday. And then um, I came out later, right. um, 
But yeah, I, with every, all my friends and stuff, I put out like a blanket message on um, Facebook and I was just like, yeah, this is, this is what's happening. Yeah, and Facebook's people, so good for that now. Yeah, and people <laughs> were just like, well, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> obviously. Yeah. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, gender dysphoria, not mm. only because not everyone knows what it is, but also I feel like as a queer person, it can be really reassuring to hear other people try and articulate it and try and kind of talk about it. I wonder if you could talk a bit about what that... Well, I think ge what gender dysphoria does vary and it's different for every single trans person. Um, but for me, I felt like it was a disconnect with what I was seeing in the mirror and um, how I saw myself. Um, whether that's like how I felt within my body or how I, what I physically saw. Or I, I say um, when I was walking past shop windows and I would catch um, my reflection in the mirror and I'd be like, who's that? Mm. And like, I just didn't recognize myself. So I wanted to undergo surgery and not everybody that's trans undergoes surgery or wants to or needs to, it's not, you know, some, or can afford to, mm. um, which is a big problem. Um, for the people that do want it. But um, yeah, I just wanted to undergo surgery so that I could just feel a calmness. I didn't go into it, like in the film, I just said that I'm not going into it wanting to look like Beyonce, yeah. even though that would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm so happy with the results, mm. but it's not because I look a certain way, even though, and I, I feel like, I, I feel like I'm more confident, mm. but I recognize myself now. Yeah. I, f I look at myself in the mirror and I'm like, I'm not squirming. I'm not, yeah. I don't feel like I want to stay inside the house or, you know, order takeout because I'm too scared to go down to the shops. Yeah. Like there, all of that was going on. There was a period of time when I was solely surviving on takeout food because I was so petrified of going down to the shops without makeup on. Yeah. So it's those kind of things that dysphoria can really mm. impact on a trans person's life. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to ask you what it was like to be part of viewing such a intense and intimate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say, I wasn't there for the surgery. I, I got out there. But I mean, first to say, it was just an incredible privilege to be allowed to witness something like that, to bring in cameras to, I would say, one of the most private moments someone can have at their most vulnerable. Um, so. It was incredible. I felt a big weight of responsibility as a filmmaker as well, because Monroe was putting her, literally herself, in our hands. Um, so it was incredible. I, I kind of felt like we were witnessing a really strong moment. I mean, I have to say, when I saw the photos, <laughs> I was kind of thinking, oh no, what have you done? <laughs> Is this going to work? Um, so. But no, it was amazing, and as I said, it, it really is about the trust that someone puts to you as a filmmaker, um, and you just want to do the best for that person and make sure you're telling their story. This is not my story, this is not Antidote's story, this is Monroe's story. And so, um, you know, we had to be very careful that we weren't sort of running off and telling a narrative that didn't fit the one that was Monroe's. Um, so yeah, an incredible moment, and utterly, shocking as well. <laughs> yeah. Who knew you could take your yeah. face and, but I mean, credit as well to all those surgeons because mm -hmm. they didn't have to let us in to a very, you know, intense two hours and have people kind of putting cameras in, etc. I mean, it took a lot of trust yeah. on that side as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, it was, it was a real privilege to do it. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm very glad that Monroe, because it was also a very quick decision oh it kind of was just you guys have no idea how quickly Laura turned all of this around <laughs> it was insane it's like I had a meeting with my management and I was like I've got this crazy idea and I know <laughs> I mean, just Mamre like, and I met, um, to chat about ideas I, I was very aware of who Mumro was I was really excited to discuss what we might do together and it was kind of one of those Columbo moments at the end we talked about all these ideas and then she said, oh, by the way, <laughs> I'm having this facial surgery. And obviously, I was like, wow, wow, wow. In two weeks. <laughs> yeah, and it was. It was in two weeks' time. And I thought, yeah. well, I have to tell you, TV doesn't move that quickly. <laughs> but TV it did will. move that quickly. Yeah. So, so it was, yeah, all yeah. the stars kind of aligned. It was, yeah. Yeah, I think you get that sense of trust from the film as well. 
Um, Mumro, you are a legendary and iconic model. Oh my God. I wondered <laughs> if you could talk a little bit about modeling and the kind of shift from modeling and activism yeah. and where they merge. Well, I mean, I never started, I never really thought of myself as a model until like the paper started calling me. <laughs> <laughs> so you. I was like, okay, well, why not? <laughs> so um, yeah, um, that that happened with um, I had I had a contract that um, didn't go how I thought it was going to go um, with L'Oreal, and I ended up being fired for speaking about white supremacy and white privilege and structural and institutional racism, which is something that I am very passionate about um, in in how we don't talk about it in society, how it's something that exists and is intertwined within our history. It impacts every single person in the country, but we don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. So um, I was speaking about it, and then I ended up getting fired because of it, which then reinforced my point yeah. that you can't talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I think um, mainly the black and queer communities um, really got behind me. And then after that, women got behind me. And then after that, I think everybody else started talking about it. And um, so I think, I don't know, people ask me if I regret speaking about it. And I think that it opened a narrative. Mm. I mean, this is something that black people have been talking about forever. Mm -hmm. And I, I wasn't saying anything you know, new. Uh, but I think for a lot of people, it was new information and it was things like unconscious bias and, um, you know, that um, employers may hold, which then um, means that black people can't get the jobs that they're qualified for. Yeah. Um, so um, I think that it, it definitely opened. It did. I think it really spearheaded a massive conversation that had not been happening outside of like black and brown and in queer communities, but not even enough in those spaces. Yeah. I think you really like forced that conversation into the mainstream. Um, and how do you feel about um, modeling now? Are you feel like yeah. people are working well, with you differently, yeah. maybe? Oh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the idea. Yeah, exactly. You know, like, when I, before it all happened, if I went on to a shoot, then I would have so many instances of makeup artists not being able to match my skin tone to makeup, um, match makeup to my skin tone. And I'd end up being shot with a grey face. Um, because they hadn't matched the, and, uh, fun fact, the L'Oreal um, campaign, I, I didn't actually use L'Oreal, <laughs> because the, the Tree Match Foundation didn't tea, match. So, um, <laughs> yeah, um, that, was, that was awkward. But, um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I, I kind of still feel it when I go and do like jobs in Paris or when mm -hmm. I go to Europe. They don't know how to do black hair. Mm -hmm. They don't know. Oh my God! They don't. They don't know how to like um, do um, kind of like um, wigs and things like yeah, that. Yeah. So um, it's still present. Mm -hmm. But I think with me, when I'm on stage, when I'm on. Um, sh um, oh God, I've had so much <laughs> coffee. When I'm when on I'm the the set <laughs> now. Um, I noticed that the backstage crew is much more diverse because yeah. I speak about it so much. Mm. And I'm like, if you want a good quality product now and you want a well-rounded product, you need to make sure that your crew is as diverse as the people in front of the camera. Otherwise, it's just voyeuristic and it's, you know, it's tokenism. Mm. And what do you think um, the role of these kind of, uh, like these mainstream visible roles will play? Like, what do you think the outcome of that will be? I guess you spoke about it a bit with the L'Oreal campaign. It, it forced these conversations mm. into a more public sphere. But I guess, what do you see maybe the next five years of modelling looking like? Well, I mean, I always say that I don't want to model unless I can use um, who I'm modelling for as a platform. Mm -hmm. So I only want to work with brands that are pushing forward how we think about beauty or how we think about um, s beauty standards or body types or anything. Because, you know, I'm not a stick thin model. Mm -hmm. I'm curvy, I'm queer, I'm mixed race, I'm, you know, all of these different intersections. So I want to make sure that I can speak for every single one of my intersections and represent my communities. <coughs> and speak about things that people hadn't necessarily thought about. Yeah. Because you forget, like, well, I forget, living in London, we're in, like, this little bubble, and it, everyone's quite liberal. 
not everybody, but like a lot of people are quite liberal. Our friends. And even the liberal people aren't very liberal, no. as we've seen with like the turf conversation, yeah, yeah. Um, which is frustrating. So I feel like everybody, if, if we're still figuring things out in London, then everybody outside is um, not behind, but... <laughs> You know, just like I feel like everything kind of filters out of London because that's kind of where a lot of people that don't fit in outside of London mm. end up going. Yeah, fair. Let's have, can we watch the next clip, please? Yeah, I loved her so much. Oh, she's amazing. And it's also just really nice when you go into these intimidating spaces and you meet someone else who's like on your level or gets oh, that's you. That's it, yeah. It's, it's community such solidarity, so isn't it? Um, we're going to have another look at a clip, but before we show it, I wondered if you could just maybe um, talk a little bit about how you see gender and gender identity and what that means to self-identify or mm. kind of have a gender realisation. Oh, I get asked this a lot. Yeah, and it's I, a I just, long I just, question. I mean, I've refined it now. <laughs> but, like, at the beginning, I was like... Yeah. But, like, at the be like, now... I just say gender identity is no one else's business but yours. That's the one. Right there. So now. Um, it's exactly, it's just however you see yourself. And that can be however. No one else has any business in telling you, no, you're not this. Yeah. Because your identity is not impacted by how other people see you. It can be, but it shouldn't. Mm -hmm. So I, I really feel that gender identity is just when you cancel out all the noise, when you don't pay attention to any, anyone else's bullshit. Mm. It's how you see yourself. Thanks, that's, really, that's a really good one. You have <laughs> refined that excellently. Can we see the next clip, please? I have to ask you, how did you find going in and having those conversations? You, you handle it very calmly and yeah. articulately. Well, I always say that it's important to speak to people that don't have the same viewpoints as yourself. And, you know, shouting into an echo chamber or preaching to the converted doesn't really go anywhere. Mm -hmm. It just kind of stays within a certain sphere. There's no penetrating um, the outside influences. So I don't actually mind, like, speaking with someone that has an alternative view as long as they're respectful. Yeah. I, I feel like when it crosses that line of respect and you're say if, if you're like saying that I don't have um, the right to access certain services mm -hmm. or don't have the right to um, you know present in a certain way or I'm less human than you essentially then I've got a problem with that but yeah. if it's like you know that that lady I've forgotten her name but um, saying that she feels that it's the way that you're born and Trans people aren't disputing that. It's we, we understand that we were assigned a certain gender at birth or, or a sex at birth, but we don't identify with that sex. Mm. So I think there's a confusion um, going on in society of that people think that trans people are saying that we're the same as cis people. And like inside, yeah, sure, but like we've got a different journey, and that, but that doesn't make us any less woman or any less man or any less non-binary. Mm. You know, it's it's just I think that there's a confusion there. Yeah, and it's interesting as well because I wonder if you do you call yourself a feminist? Is that a term that you use? Of course. But that's so funny, <laughs> isn't it? Because so do I, so militantly, but so do these women that hate. Trans women. And oh, like, yeah. Oh. Well, I mean, she wasn't a turf. Yeah. We actually went for <laughs> drinks <not> afterwards, <laughs> and she was just like, you've completely opened my eyes, which I think if... I mean, I don't feel like every single um, trans person should be an educator. I feel yeah. like we end up being educators because, um, you know, there's so few of us. And when someone who has never met a trans person meets a trans person, they're like, <laughs> tell me everything. Yeah. So, like, sometimes it ends up being like that, but... Usually, it comes from a good place. Um, so, I mean, I'm glad that I got to know those women. But mm. with TERFs, that crosses the line of respect. And they believe that we don't, des we don't um, deserve or that we shouldn't be in women's spaces because we're a danger to women, mm. um, cisgender women. But if anything shows, if like the statistics show that we're at more risk um, than cisgender women. Mm. So if anything, we should be in those spaces as well. Yeah. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit and maybe uh, define for the audience as well um, what intersexual, intersectional feminism is. 
So my understanding of intersectional feminism is um, it's a term that was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, who's an American academic, and she believes that, um, rightly, that um, all of our all of the parts of our identity, such as class, education, race, sexual, sexual orientation, gender identity, um, even like the slang that you use, all um, impacts your experience as a woman. So for feminism to be effective for everybody, it has to take into consideration that the experience of a rich white woman is going to be significantly different to the experience of a working class black woman. And that then it becomes impacted again if that working class black woman is then queer, if she's disabled, if she is um, trans. So um, it's kind of like saying that nobody's feminism can be the same, that every single person's mm. feminism has to be inclusive. And I think when I first started learning about that, I found that idea that everyone's feminism takes a different shape. I found that really liberating mm. because the moment you kind of like process that, you're like, oh, it's okay that these people that are my sisters maybe don't always understand my struggle and maybe mm. I don't understand theirs. And I think intersectional feminism is a really good way to like learn about empathy. 100%. And I think that empathy is something that we're lacking mm. as um, a society, unfortunately. Even within activism, I feel like a lot of people are only activists because it benefits them. And really, I think a activism has to be an act of allyship as well. Mm -hmm. That I'm trying to be much more involved with combating Islamophobia mm -hmm. because I can't I just can't, in my conscious, or the way that I see the world, expect people to show up for me if I'm not showing up for them. Mm -hmm. um, every time I see it, it just makes me so cross. <laughs> no, thanks, thanks for that. <laughs> um, I wonder, maybe Laura, maybe you sure. could talk a little bit about that experience because yeah. I know loads of those TERFs, loads of them organise in South London, and I've been like super involved in the no TERFs on mm. the TERF stuff, and they are insufferable and relentless and have nothing remotely interesting to say about oh, anything. They're lovely. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think from the film's point of view, first to say, because there's an argument to say, should that narrative be on television at all? But I think it has, we try to get balance in our films. We try to, despite our personal feelings and our personal opinions, we try to have an objectivity, we have to. That's the definition, I guess, of, of making a documentary. Um, so it felt important to try and get that scene within the film. I mean, <laughs> I have to be honest, we did not realise the power and the, the sort of vitriol. I didn't realise just how extreme it was. Um, I have never met a turf until making the show. Um, and I have Amingly. to be honest, <laughs> it probably will be the last one. Mm. Um, so I think it was an education for us as a production team as well. We were aware of the views um, and we felt it was important to get those views within the film in order to give context to what we were saying. And, you know, I have to say, again, credit to Monroe because we had to put Monroe in a really, really horrible situation. Mm. And I look back at it, and I, it kind of feels worse every time I watch it. Mm. Um, so it took Monroe to say yes to that, because, you know, as I always say... <laughs> with, convincing. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, I don't like to twist arms, because I don't really feel that's a responsible thing to do. You know, someone's got to do it on their terms. Mm. Um, and I suppose our job is to say, look this is the value of doing it to the film. This mm. is why we think it's really important mm. and this is how we kind of see it in the context of the film. So we aren't just throwing somebody into the lion's den and then we all go home and they have to live with the experience they've just mm. gone through. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm really glad we did that. Mm. And, and despite, you know, not be, I wasn't the one sat there, but hopefully, you know, when you watch the film as a as a whole, you can see kind of the role it has. And I think, if nothing else, just to show that viewpoint is out there. Yeah. You know, it's one thing to say, I, I don't understand transgenderism or I'm not exposed to it. It's another to come from that very 
a very extreme point of view. And I think, you know, getting the Gender Recognition Act into a documentary is quite a good thing to do. It's mm. coming up. It's, it's becoming a really big debate. And I, I feel quite proud that we've put that out there and mm -hmm. got people thinking about it a bit more. Um, but, yeah, I, I have to reiterate, we as production teams see what we want, but we don't do it. It's not us. It's not us on the line mm -hmm. in that way. And I think whatever you're doing, it has to feel collaborative and it has to feel like the team yeah. do it together. It's Bec interesting, isn't it, though, because this, this thing about like having to show both sides of a story in a documentary... Um, is strange because often it, it ends up taking the shape where we generously show this other side of the argument, but they have they have absolutely no interest. They would not give you the same respect, no. mm. which I think comes back to what you were talking to earlier about respect. I wonder if you could talk a bit about that experience being in that yeah being well, in the lions then. <laughs> yeah, I mean when um, Laura came to me with the idea of um, doing this, I initially said, absolutely, no yeah. way. No, I'm not putting myself through it. Because, as you said, like I, I don't think that anybody at the production company well, un had kind of seen anything like that. Um, it, it was, it's, they're pretty brutal, um, to be said. Um, they target people on Twitter, largely. Um, and it's it's really brutal. I mean, like fourteen year old trans kids being told that they're you know insane or that they're um, you know going to have a life of misery or all this kind of stuff. It's it's really really brutal. Um, so I I knew exactly what they were capable of, and it took me some convincing, mm. um, but I eventually said yes because I saw that it might be beneficial to the film. Mm. And it was extremely beneficial yeah. to the film because I feel like a lot of the feedback that I've got was that people didn't know that this existed. Mm. And a really shocking thing is that these women consider themselves liberal. Yeah, they consider they themselves consider, like militant feminists. They, yeah, they consider themselves to be feminists, um, part of the left. Mm. Um, they don't agree with anything like, you know, Donald Trump or they're, um, they're, very, they're very much part of, like, Labour. Mm -hmm. um, and they can't see the humanity in trans people. Mm. They this think is what's so insidious about, I think, turf organising is that it's found its way into spaces that should be safe. Yeah, of course. And it, they found their way into the media as well. Mm. Um, a lot of them are journalists and they target trans people through the media. There was a, there's a statistic that was found by um, an organization called All About Trans that they found 78% of people in the UK have misinformed um, opinions and understandings of um, trans people from the media. Right. So when we see that happening, this is all in the media as well. So this isn't just being isolated to events like this. This is being uh, put and pumped into the media that we're all consuming. And it, unless you're trans or queer or um, you know involved in communities where you're directly, um, you, you know that this, this information's false. Mm. People are just taking it in and they're just absorbing it. Mm. It's just like it's just like the homophobia that we saw, that the fear mongering, um, saying that homopho um, homosexual men um, are paedophiles, yeah, which yeah. is ridiculous. Like, how did you get from a gay man to a paedophile? Mm. But they're doing the same thing in saying a trans woman is a rapist. Mm. So I, I don't understand the connect, but it's something that history is just repeating, mm. and it's just fear mongering. Yeah, and what one when the documentary came out after it went live, did any of these women kind of get in touch? How did they feel about being on the TV show? Uh, no, I, do, I, I didn't mean, get any. I we or when you make a film, you do expect a certain amount of fallout, um, and I was expecting, but actually, I think we were so careful to give balance. Yeah. Um, I think we were very generous in that respect, um, that we didn't have a, a sort of a backlash from that. that no, I didn't actually get all. one either. Um, you know, and I think sometimes if you just give people, you let people say how they feel, there's enough nonsense within it. I think that's the nice yeah. way to put it. Yeah, yeah. The, let them do, let them say Give them it themselves. a news. You know, well, it is, it is a bit that, and I think it's got more yeah. power to it than than trying to 
cleverly edit what they've said yeah. or, mm. or kind of, you know, create a reaction to something that really wasn't there and, you know, and fake it. Mm. I think sometimes it speaks Let people very speak loud anyway. Well. Yeah. Mm. So um, I, I think they were quite happy with the film. <laughs> <laughs> I but I, wait, I can't speak... You know, yeah, but, um, but in their eyes, they don't see anything wrong with what they're saying. Yeah. We have documented what happened. We've yeah. documented the viewpoints that they put out there. So um, we haven't said anything that they aren't saying. Mm. Um, you know, and I think that's always a risk. Are you giving a platform to views that you don't want to be sort of pervaded into society? But that's the risk. I think most people saw that scene and they saw the other one mm. with the one-on-one -on -one encounter and realised very clearly where sort of common sense sat. Mm. Um, I hope so. Anyway. Yeah, I hope so too. Mm. I wonder, Moreau, if you have any advice for people on how to be allies or how to um, support trans people through these kind of uh, conversations with TERFs um, and how to kind of look after each other. Um, it's difficult because I, I don't think everyone knows a trans person mm. or but if you do then just listen I think don't don't try to give too much advice because you don't know what it feels mm. like so it's, it's it can come across as quite frustrating I think like or have you tried this and that yeah, there's nothing yeah. worse and you know, when I was dealing with self-harming, I was like, just people just saying, well, have you tried not self-harming? Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. I have, have but it's not helping. <laughs> yeah. Have you been to the Always. gym? Try <laughs> exercising. <Yeah>. No. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, so just listen yeah. um, and encourage them and support them in what they do like doing. Try and um, help them uh, um, grow in their self-worth in other areas. Um, other distractions like creative good inputs um, but really I think donate your time or money to um, resources yeah. um, and um, organizations that help trans people so if you don't know what to do channel your energy into someone that does yeah, yeah. Um, like organizations like mermaids who help transgender kids and their parents acclimatized to the changes within the household or um, organiza organizations like Clinic U, um, who offer um, free sexual health screenings for trans people. So things that are um, benefit benefiting the community, channel your time and money into the community mm. um, if you don't know somebody um, firsthand. Yeah, that's really good advice, thanks. Can we see the next clip, please? That must be so hard to watch, that's making me really emotional. Yeah. <laughs> it must be really hard. Um, I kind of wanted more to ask about um, cyberbullying and kind of the role that plays in your life yeah. and how you're dealing with it at the moment. And mm. I don't really let it get to me anymore. Mm. Um, I kind of understood um, with the labour, um, the labour controversy, because um, the way that the papers reported what I'd said ten years ago, these tweets were from like ten years, twelve years ago. Um, and the way that it was taken out of context to look like I was literally slagging off lesbians, slagging off when I was actually talking to lesbians. And it was like banter between people in the gay community, mm. just taking the mickey out of each other. And the mainstream do that. They kind and of so don't understand that. That's and also just like other. saying that I wanted to gay bash somebody when I was identifying <laughs> as a yeah. gay male at the time. It's kind of like, I don't know, it's, you know, it, it's ridiculous that taking conversations between friends and making it look like I was <laughs> speaking about every single um, lesbian or gay man mm. in the country and also that it was a decade ago. Yeah. So um, it was difficult, and also taking into consideration that we all say stupid things, especially in our early and we all 20s say them and on teenagers. Twitter. <laughs> I had five followers at that time. Yeah. I had five followers. <laughs> literally, they were all my friends. So I don't know who they think I was speaking to. <laughs> I was literally speaking to five people. Um, but yeah, and it was about a web and a little context. It was about a website called Lesbians That Look Like Justin Bieber. <laughs> And my friend got a, a my friend got a haircut, and he looked like a butch lesbian. Yeah. Um, that looked like Justin Bieber. So that that was yeah. It's really that silly. Um, but yeah. 
Yeah. I wondered if we could talk a bit about how... Um... Oh, yeah, no, cyberbullying doesn't really bother me anymore, That's really, good. personally. It bothers me that it's such a problem mm. and that people that don't have the support network like I've got or people that don't know themselves as well as I know myself, um, that for a vulnerable person, it, you know, we've got such a problem with trans people, especially trans kids and young trans people that are self-harming and um, attempting suicide. I think it's like 80%, um, which is horrendous. Mm. Um, so it really does bother me in that capacity. But for, for myself, I'm very lucky to have support, such a support network around me. So I just, I'm very single-minded now with what I need to do. Yeah, I think that's great because I like having seen the escalation of mm. how Twitter has become this really kind of like it's violent toxic. space. Yeah. It's really sad when you see people that are your peers or people you respect, people you love, people in your community just be exposed to this violence that you can't protect them from in the same way that we would all look, look after each other on the bus or in the street, you know? It's this whole other space. Um, I wondered if you could talk a bit about uh, the role you see social media playing in activism at the moment. Um. I think social media and activism, I mean, it, it's great. Um, I've met so many amazing people. I actually met my two friends, T and A, in a group called, um, oh, I won't say what it is actually, because it's a secret group, but it was a secret <laughs> group on, <laughs> on um, Facebook. And I've met so many amazing people through that group. And, through, and I um, exercise my mind and I, um, put words, I, I put language to the feelings that I'd felt for so long and I had no idea what it was called. And um, I got to read other people's experiences and realized that I wasn't crazy, that this was actually a thing. And um, I also realized that there's people like my, myself out there and that I felt supported because I knew that if I was going to say um, my feelings on a, in a, on a, um, in a, on a public platform, that there would be other people out there that think the same thing mm. and that would support me. Mm. And also that the things that I was saying are of no detriment to anybody else. It's just speaking about um, the issues that impact a community. So it made me really aware of my communities mm. and that there's other people out there like me and that we can become as assembled, um, as assembled hopefully one day as the far right because <laughs> yeah. that's, um, that's another kind of assembly. Yeah, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> we, need to, we need to be, I think as the left, we need to be much more cohesive and um, show up for each other a lot more. Mm. Um, unfortunately, I don't feel like we do enough. No. Um, I've been asked to ask you about the gender quake debate. Um, which I saw yeah. you the day after. Yeah. And I was so um, impressed at you and impressed at Ash, Saka. Yeah. And so ashamed that people had allowed that to happen. And I wondered if, I maybe you don't want to talk about it too much, but I wondered no, if you just right. wanted to touch on it and explain yeah. what it was and what happened. God, I was dreading that debate yeah. for a full two weeks. Yeah. I said, I said no. And then my manager was like, hey, we <laughs> and then the, it's like it, I think with anything when it comes to turfs, my initial reaction is, God, no, mm. I can't do anything else, and I'm not going to do anything else because there's no point now. I've kind of I've done it all now. But um, yeah, I think again it was important to show another side. And in the documentary, the documentary hadn't actually aired at that point yet. It was a week before, and I just kind of wanted people to see that this was a thing. I didn't know that it was going to be as bad as it was, and I was being heckled on live television, being called a man, and being called, um, being, uh, like, having people insinuate that I was a danger to women when, you know, trans women are literally being murdered all across the world. I mean, the average life expectancy of a transgender woman of colour, like myself, is 35 years old around the world. So technically, I've only got four years left to, to live. Um, and then to have women saying that I'm a danger to other women is awful because I need these spaces uh, because I'm at, more, I'm at more risk than them, mm. if anything. So um, it's really frustrating, but I think, again, it just showed how there was a lack of respect. Um, and I wasn't shouting obscenities at these, at these women. Um, I wasn't in any way um, stopping them from talking, but they were literally shouting at me, and I did ask for them to be removed, and, and nothing was done. Mm. 
Um, granted, it was eight minutes before um, the program was about to end, and there was a chance that the woman um, could kick off, and then that would be the end of the program. <laughs> and I think that that's what the producers, mm. um, why they didn't remove them. But right. re I don't know, it's, it's, it's a different one. not a very good one. excuse, though, is it? It's not a very good excuse, but at the same time, it's kind of like... I'm glad that they showed themselves up. Yeah. I'm glad that they showed that these women are just on a very base level disrespectful yeah. and not very nice people. Yeah, and it was interesting because that that aired and then the next day we were at a panel talking about diversity in TV and we had this conversation about, you know, if TV or production people want to work with mm. marginalized communities then they need to learn to do it with like love and respect and tenderness and in a way that understands that putting someone through that experience means you have to support them afterwards. I think the problem is that people don't know what constitutes as transphobia. Yeah. I think we're still, people are still negotiating that in their heads. And um, we're telling you what transphobia is, but it's whether or not people want to listen. Yeah. And also, I think a really good um, thing that came out of the documentary is uh, when people think of transphobia or when people think about who, uh, who are behind these keypads on these internet trolls, mm. I know that I think of this like seven foot, like muscly skinhead white man with a swastika on his back, mm. who's like out to get me. And it usually isn't that, it's no. usually like Dave 14 year olds, like or day from accountants. Yes. And like people that it don't, is. or like people that don't even know what they think. Yeah. So um, I think we instantly go to the, the worst possible case when usually it's someone who's very confused with the world who just wants to just you know, smash anybody's um, confidence mm. and just make themselves feel better because they don't know where they fit into society. But in this do in this um, debate, people got to see that the face of transphobia is kind of these middle-aged white ladies that look like your nice neighbour who's mm. tell us like saying happy happy um, Christmas, yeah, like yeah. good morning, and or, like come round for a casserole, <laughs> and like that's that's what they look like, yeah. and they don't. It's like the non-offensive face of bigotry, yeah. And it's like bigotry doesn't have a face. No, Big, bigotry is within morphs. society. That's why it's, it survives. It's, it hides in plain sight. Exactly. So I'm glad that that came out in the in the debate. Yeah, I wondered if you two could speak a little bit about the relationship that came through the process of making the documentary. I don't even know how long it took to make was very quick in was documentary it? terms. So, um, as I mentioned, I was aware of who Monroe was. I was, obviously, I think L'Oreal had put your name pretty much everywhere. Um, and I thought, wow, somebody... I'm not a big fan of the word controversial. I think it's a bit of a buzzword, but I feel controversial <laughs> is somebody who will say something no one else wants to, but I think a lot of people feel. Um, and I was just so impressed with the way Monroe had handled peers because it's far more powerful to keep your cool than to start ranting and raving, you know, and losing your shit. And I think that... So we met with, um, with Monroe's agent and we got talking. Obviously, we, we talked about the, the surgery. And then um, it all just happened very, very quickly in terms of the production. But, you know, as an independent company, production company, we need you know it takes channel four in this instance to also champion champion a project um firstly angela chan from the diversity team and shaminda nahal from the factual specialist factual department really got behind it and it really needed that you know we can say this is amazing until we're blue in the face but you know we need the channel to feel the same way so they were incredible at getting it moving very quickly we had a very hard deadline um, and then obviously it fitted into the gender quake season. So our relationship started, uh, went into a sort of overdrive <laughs> very quickly. Um, you know, and that is, as I said, a, a credit to Monroe's trust to allow us, because we didn't really have that long production, pre-production period where you like sit four down. Months, wasn't it, the whole Yeah, thing. you know, we were oh. on planes and off and, and away. Um, so, yeah. And, yeah. and uh, How many countries did we do? In well, like it was Antwerp to start with, obviously, for the surgery. Yeah, in and Germany. then um, uh, New York was New York. pretty much three weeks after that, wasn't it? Yeah. And then, um, gosh, all over the And then the Germany. Belt, yeah, um, so, yeah. I mean, it was, yeah, we were. <laughs> Jet setters, very jealous. <laughs> but, you know, I think, 
I think in a way what you get from that momentum and that kind of energy is um, a real sense of a story unfolding in real time. Mm. And, you know, and that genuinely was what was happening. It was a Monroe's unfolding story. And we had the privilege of following that, but it also allowed us to then take a very personal story and make it bigger, make yeah. it more of a national, you know, to tap into that national debate. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's... I think I was sat on Christmas Day on the Skype to the guy who runs the clinic saying, hi, can we come and film with you? <laughs> and then, you know, we delivered the film in May. Yeah. So... Super quick turnaround. Yeah, it was. It was. Monroe, what is your interest in storytelling? Um, that people need to be able to tell their own stories. I feel like, unfortunately, in a lot of um, documentaries focused around marginalised people, it's usually people telling the stories of other people. And usually those people telling the stories are of a certain social privilege. Mm -hmm. So I really want, I really love, um, I loved what um, Antidote did with Ollie Alexander about growing up um, gay within um, British society. And I, I'm so thankful that my voice was, I mean, I narrated this, I presented it, and I'm the subject. Mm. So, and some papers said that that made it extremely biased, but how is that any more biased than someone telling the story for me? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just think that we need more people um, telling stories that people haven't, her mm. haven't heard from the perspective of someone that's been through it. Yeah. Lived experience is so... Um, underrated, I think. Yeah, that's so interesting to apply the word bias to someone. Yeah, I, th I thought that that <laughs> was really about their life. <laughs> everybody holds bias, so yeah. how would that be different from me speaking about th something that I actually went through? Yeah. And I'm 100% I'm honest in the documentary. I speak about, you know, everything from rape to um, dysphoria and, like, extremely personal things mm. that took a lot to speak about it's like even now I'm feeling a little bit drained like yeah, watching it all yeah, again yeah, but sure. like I watched the documentary for the first time with Laura and Ker um, Kirsty <laughs> and Karen um, Karen um, McGann the director who I fell in love with um, and I just I needed to stay in bed for two days after yeah. it because I was just like that's four months squished into 45 minutes and it's like oh mm. but um, yeah I just want more people to be able to speak tell their own stories yeah. rather than you know have somebody tell them for them yeah, and have you got anything in the works? We've got lots in the works. Ooh, we, we've got our heads down, haven't we? Certainly have. Um, Scheming. Trying to figure out the next thing, um, but it's coming. And I've got a talk show that I'm going. Yeah, I'm so excited about yeah, this. Yeah, keep an eye out for that. That that will be um, end of summer, hopefully. Amazing. Um, if not before, and then um, yeah, walking in a London Fashion Week show tomorrow. So I'm off to London now <laughs> <laughs> um and uh, yeah we've got lo we've got loads of stuff yeah, it's, busy. it's yeah a bit of acting bit of yeah a bit of everything amazing yeah but i just want to just make sure that i can use everything yeah to speak about what i really want to talk about yeah. which is the issues that affect my communities because it affects everybody yeah you know um because you know one person succeeds and it doesn't take away from another person it, it only makes society better if mm -hmm. everybody's thriving and everybody's happy yeah can we just have a look at the last clip? Yeah. My final question to you before we ask, ask the audience, actually, is where do you see the future, the conversation about gender going? Where do you think um, possibilities are? I would like the conversation to move beyond the binary, to move away from um, just speaking about transgender women. I would like to hear more about um, the issues that um, trans men face. Um, Kenny Jones is an activist who was on the gender quake yeah. debate as well. And he speaks a lot about um, how he still experiences the, um, the pain of periods, even though um, physically he doesn't um, get one, um, just experiences the pain. And that's something that I just never even thought about. So um, yeah, I just want just the conversation to move past what bathrooms we use because it's such mm. a boring conversation and so ridiculous. Like how, uh, yeah. um, it really doesn't make any sense. Like when we've, you know, we've, we've all been in a unisex toilet. So if, if you change the word to gender neutral toilet, then how does that 
affect anyone. It's ridiculous. Mm. So, um, yeah, I would like the conversation to push past that, to speak more about non-binary people and the evol evolution in language um, using they um, instead of he or she and how um, language always evolves. So why is it a problem when we need to evolve language to actually help a cross-section of society? Um, it's crazy. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I just think that there's so many more important and exciting things to speak about yeah, than just, sure. you know, someone's private moment doing a poo. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and everyone's house is a gender-neutral toilet in. Everyone's what? house is and the Channel 4 toilets Indeed are gender-neutral. The Feet jazziest here. toilets I've been in in a while <laughs> as well. Um, <laughs> does anyone have any questions? We've got about 10 minutes. Hi. Hi, there's someone from, from another planet that I didn't know who you were. Oh. Oh, no, no. I just thought Mariah Carey strained her hair. Oh. <laughs> so many people say that on Instagram, and I was like, I do not see it. You, you're at more all. beautiful. So, <laughs> okay. so I have a few things to say. I made some notes. Um, uh, um, this country has the top scientists and geneticists and DNA. I haven't seen your film, and I will see your film. Uh, when someone says a person is born what they're born, Yes, but not yes, because if, if you put in that there's that little line that the chromosome flipped the other way, my little nephew at three years old was painting his nails and wearing dresses and this and that, and so today he is you. He hasn't had the operation. But his parents, of British doctors, are in America, and they're the top scientists in the world. They haven't come behind this. What, what those doctors have to do is explain this to people. And I go to Sundance, I'm a Sundancer, and it's so sad because the largest percentage of teenage suicide is in this Mormon state where they're told if you have any feelings of this, you are you burn in hell, so they commit suicide. So your message is so important. I, I wish that you should have a Thank TV you. program. You should be on Friday We're night. We're working on I'd it. Watch right. you. Okay. Then Get all those it. stupid <laughs> fat men at the BBC, I don't want to hear them anymore. In my <laughs> hotel room, in the, my yeah. hotel room. Seriously, in my hotel room up the road, it only has British channels. I don't have that. I live in France, so I watch Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Russia even, Euro News, France News, everything. I, I'm not in this world anymore. Mm. And it's like since I came into the country, I put this fish tank over my head and I'm watching people talk about Theresa May and Boris Johnson. That's not what's happening in this world. <laughs> so your message is so important and so dynamic. Thank you. Um, but scientists have to put themselves behind you. For sure. And, and this myth about, and this bashing, this bashing that I saw, I was shocked. <clears throat> I was shocked because there's a level of vulgarity, of uneducation, of crudity, because there's a lack of education in this country. Mm. There's, there's the Eton, Cambridge, Oxford set, and then there's the people that, can, that do the film like the other night, A Northern Tale. For sure. The extreme disparity of wealth I lived in this country since the 1970s. I went to school here and everything. By the way, I, I worked on the first Sundance, Sundance film called Metamorphosis back in 88. I shot some of that. And she's going to make a sequel now. That shocked everybody, especially in Utah, because it's a sin to change your gender. So you, there's just so much in what you have to say. But it's the Britain, the shame and the stigma and the sinfulness because those eaten, just like we saw in the Jeremy Thorpe documentary, those homophobes, they're the ones that'll hire people. And it's so sinful and shameful that you, that's where you find the crime. So I think Britain has to look at itself mm -hmm. and its little boy schools and this phobia. Because in other countries, I can't say that, Planet of the Apes and Trump and Pence, they, they are, they're dealing with this too. But in this country, there is an extreme homophobia because this is latent, uh, encouraged homosexuality, and then they get violent. So you need to have your own show, and I should make a question out of this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just, it, this is so beautiful because my, my nephew is going through this now in America. He's British, he's half British. He can only live in San Francisco or New York because otherwise he's going to be killed, mm. as you know. This is dangerous. So you're... You're empowering people by saying how normal this is. This is normal. 
Yeah, for sure. And I feel like scientists are moving towards a common consensus that um, gender identity is completely different from sex. And in the documentary, um, we actually talk about how, you know, I mean, it starts with babies, doesn't it? It starts with looking at um, genitals and saying, that's a woman or that's, you know, that's, that's a man. And the likely you know, the likelihood is, because percentage-wise, that they may identify with the genitals and they may see themselves as a woman, but it's not always going to be the case. But in that not always going to be the case, we can't just cut and dry, say that this is blanket for everybody. So we all exist on a spectrum. And the scientists that mm. we had in the documentary all said that um, we, we exist on a spectrum. So um, I, I feel like the more studies and the more... Um, it's difficult to say, you know, encourage trans people to be part of studies because we're all trying to get on with our lives but um it's data isn't it essentially and if they don't have the data science is data so um, we need the data and we need people to be involved in these um, studies and support supporting science essentially especially when um you know we've got trump and pence trying to um, outlaw scientists and, you know, America's only over the pond and Theresa May's not like a hot foot away from Satan, so... <laughs> Wait, sorry, we're going to have oh, to sorry. take another question. Thank you. Um, thanks. I didn't know if there was somebody else who wanted to speak. Um, welcome to Ireland anytime. We're practically a turf-free zone. As you you're are, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> well. <laughs> and, and I think it's because um, of the massive win in Ireland for bodily autonomy. Yay. Yeah, yeah. And um, our trans movement has been centre and, and mm. stage forward as part of our movement in Ireland. I think that that context has totally shaped um, I became the, aware of that through Sean Fay. Yes, I'm friends with her on Facebook. I'm very lucky. And she's amazing. Follow um, her, Sean Fay. Yeah. She's <laughs> absolutely brilliant. Uh, but 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 the real question I want to ask though is really about the women, gender, and activism and filmmaking. Okay. Because even though we st that's a very positive context, the narrative or the films that are still being made and shown at let's say the Irish LGBT Film Festival gays still are about um, trans bashing. Um, and just really horrible endings. And it's yeah. as if that experience is constantly being retold and retold mm. and retold. And what, you're, you're, you're very successful and you're making other programs and that, but how do you think you can be involved or engaged with supporting other, you know, whether young people of color, young trans mm. people who want, who, who want to basically you know, um, tell the stories from their own communities. What do you think are the ecosystems that are needed to support and sustain th that type of thing? Or are you part of any of um, any of that kind of ecosystem to support younger people? Uh, to, to kind of, because this is one of the most diverse audience I've seen at the mm. Sheffield Doc Festival, and I'm more interested yeah. in this diversity than people like me, for example. Mm -hmm. So uh, how, how can, you know, the people here who, you know, want to get this shit together, can they get it done? <laughs> oh, God, that's, it's a, it's, that's a difficult question. Um, I think that you'd be good to... Yeah, like, um, I mean, one thing I, I sort of sit here and think about is actually, as a production company ourselves, we could do a lot... We could be a lot better at, you know, I'm a white woman, OK, so I'm not a white man. I'm, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> I am not the most diverse person sat here at all. And it's a responsibility for companies who, like ours who are making programs about these really important subject matters that we've got people on our teams who are from those communities or, um, you know, aren't just coming from one perspective. I mean, obviously, working with Monroe, it's a collaboration anyway, and Monroe is not going to let us put something out that is not, yeah. you know, in her view as well. But, you know, I think from our perspective... And to answer your question about getting people's voices out there, I think companies need to put, be working with those people more. Um, and that doesn't always mean, you know, bringing them into your payroll. That could be, let's collaborate with you. You know, can we help you make your film mm. rather than take it and make it for ourselves? Could we, you know, provide some help and advice where it's useful? And, you know, and I think... We have been talking about that more as a company, and I think it's really important. We're not a big company. I think it's really important that 
m more than us are thinking that way. And I, th I do believe they are, but, you know, actions speak louder than words, don't they? I think another great thing that I, I see, especially forming in London, are um, femme collectives. So it doesn't even need to be all, everybody identifying as a woman, but um, ident um, identities that surround like the femme spectrum. Um, just coming together and just different people. There's a great collective called Babes. <laughs> <laughs> they're here. They're um, yeah, yeah, they're DJing tonight. And um, just all of the content that comes out of Babes and comes out, I was part of a collective called Pussy Palace as well. Um, and I'm no, I no longer work with them, but they're my best, they're my best friends. Um, but we just all, land Babes, create content that um, pushes forward um, what it means to identify as how we identify. And in doing that, um, that can consist of our installations. We worked with the B&A, worked with Tate, um, Babes work with Tate, and in working with Tate, you created so much content within that spectrum. There was film in there, there was, um, there was um, visual art, there was um, panel talks, and I feel like just using spaces that weren't necessarily built for us and taking them over and um, redefining like how they're meant to be used, I think that that's the future. I think that, that that's really exciting. Hmm. We've got time for one more. Sorry, it's a toe triggering. <laughs> Tate, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're <back now. laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm 14 and I came out as trans, like as a trans guy, how many years ago? Like two and a half years ago. And I've been to like three, yeah, three different secondary schools because of like you said, suicide attempts and mental health and, like, mm -hmm. all of that. But now people are coming to me for advice because, like, because on my Instagram... Thank you. <laughs> because on my Instagram I talk openly about, like, a lot of things, including, like, and like you said, sexual assault and um, just being queer. But I don't really know how to give, uh, like, amazing advice apart from, mm -hmm. like, my experience. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if you had any advice for, like... And also, like, educating my parents. Yeah. Now people are asking for how to educate their own parents, and I just don't know because my parents were very... They're very liberal, and they're very, like, lovely people. And even they took, like, a lot of, like, getting used to it, and they were very confused, yeah. and they did think it was a phase, which was frustrating, but obviously that's, like, the natural assumption to make. Mm. But, I was, yeah, I was just wondering if you mm. had any advice for that. It's difficult because, uh, as, you, as you know, no one's transition is the same as anybody else's. So my advice might be null and void <laughs> for somebody else. And it, it's difficult as well. And, like, navigating privilege as well. I think privilege comes uh, is a huge part, has a huge part to play in um, transitioning, like, how, um, you know, how easily you blend into society if, I mean, that may not even be a goal, but um, just in, like, what abuse you may receive on the street to how much money you have to what access you have. Um, so it, it's, it's difficult, but I think just bearing in mind um, that we're, well, I don't know about yourself, but I'm not a, I'm not a therapist and I'm not a counsellor, so I just bear in mind what services I can direct people to, and also be try and um, be aware of um, firsthand what they do. Like I sat in on a um, training day with um, mermaids, and I've um, worked with mermaids and spoken um, with them. And um, I think getting involved with different organisations is a really good. It's a really good move. Sorry, mermaids I have to cut you off. Amazing. I'm getting sorry. The sorry, mermaids, definitely. Mermaids, incredible. Thank you all for coming. Sorry, the questions were short. Um, thanks, thanks, Monroe. Thank you. Thank you.